Hey everyone. For this last video, I'd like to give you a very quick introduction to the mind-body problem. This is a topic from the philosophy of mind. We're going to be talking about consciousness and philosophical zombies. This is actually a very big topic, and I can't hope to say very much about it in this video. What I can do is briefly set up some of the questions and then provide one argument that occurs within this subject. Okay, so approaching this topic for the first time, one of the things that we can ask is, what is a mental state? What makes a state mental? Well, this is actually a pretty big question. It's fairly tricky to define what a mental state is um, in a way that encompasses all the things that we would want to call mental states. What I can do is give you a list of mental states. So for example, I would include thoughts and beliefs and desires. These are called intentional mental states because they have to do with how the mind represents the world. For another list of mental states, we could also include visual experiences, um, smells, tastes, color experiences, pains and pleasures. These are called sensations. When we're talking about consciousness, we are mostly talking about the latter half of that list. We're talking about sensations. We are not so much talking about the intentional mental states like beliefs and desires. Why? Well, it seems like I can have beliefs and desires that I'm not consciously aware of. So we shouldn't just lump beliefs and desires into consciousness automatically. Um, there's actually an ongoing dispute in philosophy as to what the relationship is between the intentional mental states and conscious states. But we're just going to leave this aside. What we'll do is we're just going to ignore belief and the other intentional mental states, and we're just going to talk about sensations. All right, so let's go back to consciousness. Um, here are three definitions to keep in mind when thinking about consciousness. When we say that a being is conscious, what we mean is that there is something that it is like to be that being. If something is conscious, then it will have phenomenal or subjective aspects to its experiences. There will be ways in which things seem or appear to that subject. That is, opposed to the way things objectively are, there will also be ways that things seem or appear or feel to that subject. Lastly, um, in philosophy, we have a name for the subjective qualities of experience. Philosophers call these qualia. Basically, qualia refers to what it's like to have an experience as a conscious subject. So for example, as a conscious being, there is something that redness seems like to me. There's a, there's a color that, it, um, that appears to me when I see something that's red. That is called a quail. It's an instance of qualia. There's also the way that coffee smells to me. That's another quail. Or how pain feels to me. That's another quail. All of these subjective feelings are qualia. One of the long-standing controversies in the philosophy of mind has to do with whether the subjective aspects of experience, the qualia, can be explained in terms of objective physical states and processes. For example, one might wonder whether um, subjective experience can be explained by the states and events that occur within the brain. There are many positions that philosophers have taken on this question, um, but what we'll do is we'll just zoom out and look at the two big opposing camps. On the one side to this dispute, there are physicalists. Phys physicalists claim that mental states are all ultimately reducible and explained by physical states. This means that they think that consciousness can be explained in terms of brain states. As for the qualia, the physicalists will either have to say that qualia are reducible to brain states, or they will say that qualia just don't exist at all. 
On the other side of this controversy are dualists. Dualists claim that not all mental states are reducible to brain states. They will think that there are some mental states, perhaps qualia, that exist over and above the physical states and cannot be reduced to them. They think that consciousness is somehow separate from physical states. One way to visualize the difference between physicalism on the one hand and dualism on the other is through the concept of a philosophical zombie. A philosophical zombie is basically defined to be a creature that is physically indistinguishable from a normal person, but it lacks consciousness. So if there's a philosophical version of me or philosophical zombie version of me, um, then uh, it will be a creature that has all of the same brain states as me. It will look like me on the outside. It'll act just like me and it'll speak just like me. If you ask it a question, it'll answer exactly as I will answer the question. Basically, from the third personal perspective, from the objective perspective, it'll, it'll be indistinguishable from me. But if it's a philosophical zombie, then it will not have any private conscious experience. It does not have any qualia. Things on the inside are, are dark, so to speak. There is nothing that it is like to be a philosophical zombie. Philosophical zombies lack consciousness. The reasons why, the, the reason why philosophical zombies are relevant um, to uh, the philosophy of mind is because they illustrate the difference between physicalism and dualism. See, if a philosophical zombie is possible, then there could be a being that has all of the same physical states as myself and yet lacks consciousness. If that were the case, then it follows that consciousness must be something that is separate from my physical states. In that case, consciousness cannot be reducible to my physical states, and so dualism would have to be true. So just to summarize, if philosophical zombies are even possible, then dualism must be true. On the other hand, if physicalism is true, then all mental states, including consciousness, must be reducible to physical states. In that case, there cannot be any philosophical zombies. It wouldn't even be possible for there to be a philosophical zombie. For if I'm conscious, and my consciousness is explained in terms of states of my brain, then any being that shares the same brain states as me must be conscious too. That just follows from physicalism. So just to summarize, philosophical zombies are possible only if dualism is true. Once we see the difference between dualism and physicalism in terms of philosophical zombies, then we might be able to make an argument for dualism by using this concept. In fact, the philosophers Saul Kripke and David Chalmers have advanced arguments like this. The argument basically goes as follows. Premise one, I can imagine or I can conceive of a philosophical zombie. Premise two, if philosophical zombies are conceivable, then they are possible. Premise three, if philosophical zombies are possible, then dualism is true. Conclusion, dualism is true. Now, this argument is valid, and I've already explained why the third premise is true. So the question of whether this argument is sound really comes down to the first and the second premise. These are the premises that have been the source of controversy between dualists and physicalists. So I'm just going to end this video by putting the question to you. Do you think that premise one and premise two are true? Do you think that philosophical zombies are conceivable? Can you really imagine these creatures? And secondly, if you can, um, if they are conceivable, does it follow that they are possible? If you can imagine something, does that mean that that thing 
could exist.